What's up Mets fans? Welcome back to the channel and we have an awesome discussion to be had today folks because as you see we are discussing the top 10 free agent targets for the New York Mets this offseason. Once the lockout is lifted myself alongside Draft Neck Mark and James Shiano, the boys from the Mets Up podcast. Links in the description as always folks so make sure to check them out. We'll be breaking down our list 10 to 1 in this in-depth discussion. So of course folks if you find yourself enjoying this kind of Mets content and you want to see more great Mets content like this don't hesitate from smashing that like and subscribe on sharing this video with your friends put on the notification bell all those great things thank you all so much for the continued support folks now let's jump right into today's video before we go any further folks i have to let you all know that today's video is brought to you by DraftKings sportsbook the nfl playoffs are here folks and DraftKings sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the nfl is kicking things off with a huge offer counting down to super bowl 56 new customers can get 56 to 1 odds on any nfl playoff team to win their game bet just five dollars and win 280 in free bets if your team is victorious that's right just bet $5 on any NFL playoff team and DraftKings Sportsbook will give new customers an additional 280 in free bets if the team they choose does in fact win. And if Sportsbook isn't available in your state, you still have something to play for this NFL playoff weekend. DraftKings is giving all their new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use my code LGM, and get 56 to 1 odds on any NFL team. Bet just $5 and win 280 and free bets if your team wins. That's promo code LGM at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. All right, we got the Mets up boys here. How's it going, fellas? Fantastic. Doing, doing good. Can't complain. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I know that we haven't had anything to talk about, unfortunately, that we're in this horrendous lockout, and who knows how long this is going to drag on for. But I have been wanting to talk to both of you guys about what you think is the best fit for the Mets for agency wise. So let's break down our top 10 for agents that we think makes sense for the Mets. And of course, this is not including any potential trades. That's something that can be discussed a separate time. We're just focusing on for agency because the Mets, they've done all their damage at this point in the for agent market. So really without further ado, let's just let's just dive right into this. Right. So starting off at number 10, Mark, who is your number 10 for agent that you'd like to see the Mets go after? Yeah, this one's a little bit weird. It's a flyer. It's someone that I think has potential that he's had potential for it feels like 10 years now or whatever it's been but i went with carlos martinez uh it, the cardinals just really haven't had any success it feels like in developing guys who are like power pitchers like especially on the starting you know aspect of it and i think at the absolute worst with carlos martinez get a little hefner magic on him he becomes like a swing man who could pitch like two or three innings out of the bullpen every few days which i think would be super valuable um i like the idea of him being a project over a guy that's doesn't have as good of stuff like Carlos Martinez that we've seen the Mets take a risk on, you know, recently. Wow. I did not expect that one at all. That completely threw me off guard. Uh, James, what about you? What's your number 10? I went with a similar idea as Mark, but instead of a pitcher who was bad, I went with one who's actually good. And that is Danny Duffy, who's a similar swing man who also has really good stuff. But unlike Carlos Martinez is not a complete catastrophe on the mound. Last year, a lot of people forget, but before the Dodgers made their trade for Max Scherzer at the deadline, they actually picked up Danny Duffy because in the first half of the Royals, he threw 60 innings. He struck out 26% of the batters he faced. He had 2-5 ERA, which is all very impressive. He has a very deep repertoire. He throws five pitches, and all three of his breaking balls had a whiff rate of over 30%. His fastball still sits 94, 95 miles an hour. I think he's a guy who the Mets could sign coming off of a flexor strain, which is what kept him out of the whole second half of the Dodgers after that trade who could probably comfortably give them between 80 and 110 innings from the left side, which would be very useful. See, Duffy is a pick I like. I had a feeling you are going to have him on your list. I don't have him on mine, but I'm like, yeah, that's definitely a pick for James for sure. And I'm going down a very similar route as both of you guys with Clay and Kershaw, obviously. So Kershaw is someone that I do think is not likely based on location alone um, outside of his health issues. But if he is someone that would be willing to potentially leave out west go from say going from california texas to the east coast then yeah i do think that the mets could be a suitor for him again it does feel like that's far-fetched that's why i have him all the way at 10 because if location and injuries weren't an issue for someone like him he's easily towards the top of my list there's no doubt in how much of impact he'd bring in this rotation just imagine a three-head monster with degrom scherzer and kershaw healthy those are the three best pitchers in baseball uh, at least some of them right so kershaw who again only pitched right around 120 innings this past year had again an injection in his 
elbow. He should be ready for the season, but definitely dealt with his fair share of injuries. Three and a half year, Ray. I still like the shot that if you're able to potentially lure him away, Steve Cohen is that one owner that can make it happen, given all the money that he has. So you can never count Steve out. That's why I have Kershaw on this list. I think that he is far-fetched, however, and that's why I have him here at number 10. Yeah, I just really think that Clayton Kershaw would break out into hives if he crossed the Mississippi going east. <laughs> <laughs> the dude crumbled under pressure in LA. Put him in New York. I know we're not, you know, the premier destination apparently in New York for pressure, but the Mets fans are going to put on some pressure these next couple of years. I got a feeling, and Clayton Kershaw eh, is a little no, sketchy with it sometimes. But I, I trust Clayton Kershaw under pressure. I think that's mean. We we might see him a little later in my list, though. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> We'll see what the opinions are, if they're the same or different, if it actually comes to fruition. You know, that's a big thing, too. So we'll mm -hmm. see. But getting on to number nine now, uh, G uh, Mark, starting with you, what's your number nine pick that you'd like to see uh, the Mets go after? Yeah, um, I'm not as high as some other people on this guy, but you say Kikuchi, uh, we need a third starter. We need not necessarily he's our three starter, but we need another starter to this rotation. And left-handed gives us a little bit of a different look. And last year, didn't he do something where he, like, had the hardest average fastball velo among left-handed starting pitchers got, or something like that. I, I got I got Kikuchi stats later. He's high. Good, on yeah. List. You can read them all out. I just know that there were improvements that he made last year. He was an all-star in the first half. The Mariners got a little bit out of him, and he opted out of his contract. So, like, I think he's probably sought after by a pretty good chunk of teams, um, especially if he keeps that velo up. And Mets, we've been able to do some stuff with pitching, so why not you say? I like that pick for Kikuchi. I have him just off my list. Only because he's someone that, yes, the Mets showed interest in, obviously, uh, leading up to the lockout. But for them to pivot from, you know, a Kikuchi and a Steven Mass type that we saw to even trying to get Kevin Gosman along with Max Scherzer leads me to believe that if they're going to address this rotation, they're still going to focus heavily on landing another big name, like a number number three versus, say, just a depth starter. So he's definitely possible. I just personally don't see him as likely right now. But James, uh, what's your pick for number nine? All right, the ninth uh, ranked free agent who I want the Mets to sign the most is actually Joe Kelly. So another Dodger here. I think that Joe Kelly just for years has been one of the most underrated relievers in all of baseball. Like since that World Series performance, the Red Sox pitched a lot of pressure at the Dodgers last few years. He still throws 99 miles an hour. He still has a curveball that will just make a man's knees buckle. I think that Joe Kelly is an extremely high floor reliever that will not cost an arm and a leg. That could be very helpful for the Mets as a back end of the bullpen role. I like that one. Yeah, I like that pick a lot. I like Joe Kelly a lot for his personality alone. And yes, he still is a very strong reliever. And speaking of relievers, I have Ryan Tapera. He's someone that I probably would have a little bit higher, but I have him here at nine, just given you'll see throughout the video. But he's someone that really has surprised me over the past year plus, especially in Chicago, not just with, of course, the Cubs, but also the White Sox. Seeing what he did, had himself a really strong season with a sub three year rate, 2.79. And it's times ERA 2.53 and right around 60 games, 65 games played and 61 innings pitched. Uh, the projections for his contract looks around two years and around a solid AEV, around seven or eight mil. I see that's definitely something that you do for someone like Tapera. I'm um, given this point in his career. The Mets need to add relievers. That's for certain. They're going to add at least two to three, I would say, by the time the season has begun. And he's definitely towards the top of my list of relievers. I like to see them go after. And with a trade market, not, not knowing exactly exactly how many guys are going to be available on that route. The Mets are going to focus heavily in free agency, I believe, to address the majority of their holes still. So yeah, bullpen wise, I really like Ryan Tapera as a potential fit on a multi-year deal. It's very solid for sure. Awesome. Okay. Well now gain in a number eight, Mark, what's your pick? Um, I went reliever route. I went with Adam Adovino, New York guy. Uh, I think in Boston, He's kind of gotten a little bit of a, he got a little bit of an unfair rep last year. Um, I still think he's really good. He still strikes out like 25% of the batters, which like, I, if that's his like worst, that's, that's still pretty good for a guy who's not going to come in and be our eighth inning or one of our main, you know, guys out of the bullpen. Um, I feel like he could be relatively cheap. I feel like he still has good stuff. That slider still is disgusting. Uh, I like Adam Adovino a lot. I like that pick. Like I've been too. That slider is still so good, and he just he just walks guys. But that's much, much less of a deal in the NL East, opposed to the AL East. Yeah, I mean the the quality of hitters. While we do have like Juan Soto and Harper and Acuna, like top to bottom, the teams aren't as strong. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, James, what's your pick? My next pick, I'm taking a cop out because I'm going to pick two guys, but it's just because I really think that this Mets Ooh. roster can use 
a right-handed hitting outfielder that doesn't cost an arm and a leg and you don't have to make a real commitment to. And my guys are Tommy Pham and Andrew McCutcheon. With Pham, you get a little bit more athleticism and you get a little, a little better defense. With McCutcheon, you get a little more power and a little bit worse defense, whichever way the Mets want to go there. I think you can sign either guy for something like one year, nine, ten million dollars, and you're getting like a professional, a guy who can play for 90-ish games, platoon basically with Canada and Nimmo as a guy who makes sure we always have the right-handedness going on with uh, our corner outfielders, depending on who we're hitting, pitching, uh, whoever's pitching against us, and who can just give us quality major league at bats off the bench consistently, while also giving competent defense, which the Mets don't have that right now for a backup outfielder besides McNeil, who might still be a starting infielder. Yeah, I like that pick a lot, especially we were saying going into the recording, Tommy Pham is someone that I originally had on my list. He's an honorable mention for me. I think that especially him or McCutcheon alike would make so much sense for the Mets, you know, as a fourth outfielder, splitting time with someone like Canna or whoever gained plenty of at-bats. They're both high on base guys still. And the Mets have clearly shown that they're not shying away from older vets right now, depending on what their utilization is going to be. So as long as they're not necessarily your everyday outfielder, I'm by all means, I'm on the train of fam or even someone like McCutcheon. He had a lot of pop in his bat this past year. He had north of 30 home runs. So yeah, I'm definitely not against someone like McCutcheon. No, I think it'd be a major improvement over Kevin Pillar as a fourth outfielder going into next season. Yep, that's yeah. exactly what I was saying. Is like we talked about it all year. Like we need to have full 26 man roster of good, competent players. Not that Kevin Pillar isn't competent, but these guys are better, without a doubt. Yes, certainly. And they'll cost more, but we have the money, so who cares? Support people problems. Absolutely. Now, my number eight pick might not be as what you would expect, at least for Mark. I have already Kyle Schwarber down here, and I would love Schwarber on the Mets. I just feel like for him wanting a multi-year deal more than likely, I find it hard to believe that the Mets would want to commit that amount of money to strictly a guy that's going to be a DH because he doesn't profile well outfield-wise. He's really like Dom Smith in a lot of different ways as that lefty bat. That difference is Kyle Schwarber actually murdered not just the Mets, but the entire MLB this past year. Like He was just raking all season long, had 9 to 10 home runs against the Mets when he was with Boston and D.C. He was ridiculous, had himself 32 bombs. 71 RBIs and just 113 games played, playing between the two clubs. I think if you can land Schwarber and have him as your DH fit on a short to mid-level deal, I'm all for it because he's only 28. Maybe you sign him for three, four years. He'll be 32 by the time the contract's done. I'm all in favor for it. I just don't think that's the route the Mets are actually going to want to go down. So because of that reason, that reason alone, that's why I have him all the way down to the eight spot. Yeah, we talked about this two episodes ago on Mets Stop Podcast, but I just can't see a player who doesn't play defense well helping the Mets right now well the way the roster is currently arranged like if you can get rid of either Cano Dom or JD then you can bring in a non-defensive player in one of those spots but the, with all three of those guys currently on the roster no home for any of them it's hard for me to see how they would commit legitimate money to someone who's just not good at defense yeah yep no I agree with you especially on a multi-year deal I think if it was a one-year deal type thing with Schwarber, I think it's a very different conversation, but I just don't see how he gets anything less than three or four years for good reason, right? Yeah. Um, but now getting on to the number number seven spot, Mark, let's start with you. What's your pick? Yeah, I got uh, Jake Diekman, my Crohn's buddy. Uh, he's got colitis, a little, little bit different, but uh, we, we do share the same idea there. Uh, yeah, also, he's a good player. He's a really good reliever. We could use a left-handed guy out of the bullpen right now after we lost Loop. And Diekman is a super like nasty power pitcher. He learned a, a new pitch last year after watching Pitching Ninja stuff on Twitter, which I think is super cool. Did he really? Um, I didn't know yeah, that. it was a new grip, and it actually helped him out a lot early on in the season. Um, gets a lot of swings and misses. He does walk a ton of guys as well, which that's you know the give and take here. But I I'll take it for Jake Diekman. I don't know. If we're going up against Juan Soto, Bryce Harper, Freddie Freeman again, I feel pretty good with Jake Diekman on the mound to beat all three of those guys. Um, and we are going to go up against those dudes pretty often as long as – Freeman stays in the division as well. So I'll go Diekman. Diekman is a very underrated pick. I have him as one of the top bullpen targets for the Mets this offseason, especially with the Mets needing a lefty in that pen, at least one right. I think he's going to sneak under the radar a bit. And if Jeremy Hefner can get his hands on him, I think that can really help with control a bit. Um, he's still someone that has upside. And if you look at his numbers, especially this past season, definitely can be a, a low risk, high reward type move. Sneaky, kind of similar to Aaron Loop in the sense that Mets fans, including myself, didn't have expectations that he pitched to a sub one year way, year ray, right? But look at where we are. So, yeah, I like that one a lot. But, James, what's your pick for number seven? I'm also going with a left handed reliever who's probably going to cost a little bit less than Deekman. Mark knows where I'm going here. I've been talking about him for a few weeks, but it's Adam Conley 
Someone oh, who's really probably that's flying that's under most people's radar. He was a starter in the Marlins system about four years ago. They turned him into a reliever. His fastball jumped up from 92, 93 miles an hour to like something like 97 miles an hour, which is just that's a that's a place I'd like to be. And he has this like a pitching term. He can really well tunnel his fastball as opposed to his changeup. So it looked basically exactly the same out of the hand. And then the fastball continues to rise while the changeup fades. And it creates this again, like kind of tunneling like thing. So it's hard for hitters to pick up exactly what pitch he's throwing. And he's someone who's never really had great results in the past, but every, every off season, I've always been telling Mark of reliever or two, I think is going to be found and just become a monster. Last year was Kendall Graveman, Ranger Suarez, or two years ago was Graveman. But I, I have that little feeling inside my heart that this year it's going to be Conley. And I would love for the Mets to sign him to something like a two year, $6 million deal. Yeah, anytime James gets on a, a random reliever that doesn't deserve as much talk as he's giving it, I usually buy onto it because he's been cash in like the last two years. So Adam Conley seems to be the guy this year. And the Rays picked him up. There's something there. There's Definitely. something there. And the Rays only let him go because they had such a glut of their major league roster. Like they had to trade a guy like Joey Wendell for basically nothing. So they ended up cutting Conley because they have so many relievers who throw 97 miles an hour. But we don't have that many relievers who throw 97 miles an hour. And from the left side, that 97 mile an hour fastball was the 16th highest uh, velocity fastball for any lefty in the league last year. It threw at least 250 pitches. So I think Conley is a guy you can get in this bullpen with pretty low expectations and impress. I really love your approach with kind of finding, you know, a diamond in the rough, if you will, because that's yeah. so important when you look at relievers, because of the guys that you'll see on my list and the list of you guys, too, a lot of them are guys that are coming off of career years or close to, and naturally, they're probably not going to have that same exact production again. Relievers are so, they remind me so much of a roller coaster. You're going to have maybe your one to two year rate, then they're going to jump to even a four plus year rate the next season. A lot of them lack consistency. So trying to find those diamonds in the rough, really not that you need a ball on a budget to land them, but for the Rays to go after someone like Connolly is awfully telling. And it reminds me a bit of Sam McWilliams last off season for the Mets. Yes, it didn't work out, but that was a pickup where there was some hype going into it that this guy has the tools. Now, can the Mets find a way to put it together? Unfortunately, for their sake, they couldn't. They ended up letting him go, and he went to the Padres. Uh, but point being is that, yes, you definitely want to make sure that you're trying to get the best talent. And the Mets are now in a spot, thankfully, where we can see them develop young guys in the bullpen year after year where they're going to adopt more of that raise that Dodgers even that Yankees philosophy so they have the big market the spending but they're also going to have the analytics department to back it we're really finding guys where maybe you didn't expect a lot from them and maybe you're concerned oh why didn't they do these moves in the offseason but in reality they might have guys in the organization already that they're going to help blossom that are going to um, surprise some people so I, I like that idea for sure but for me personally for number seven I'm sticking with the big bats I'm sticking with the DH and a guy that I would have loved to see on the New York Mets to finally come back to the Mets after being signed by them literally like 100 years ago that being Nelson Cruz I think if the Mets are going to go short-term DH wise if they're going to go externally I think Boomstick is your guy because one you don't have to commit long term to him he's not going to cost you much and yes he'd be able to rekindle with his former manager two-time manager and Buck Showalter and he still rakes I know that he didn't do great in the second half of the season with Tampa but I'm not really putting too much stock in that you know Cruz in his 40 year a uh, 40 year old age season still had a very respectable year 32 bombs 86 RBIs 265 334 497 slash line it depending on obviously if you can part with robinson cano that's the biggest wild card um if you can either part with him or potentially have him in a role that's not going to impact the mets much then by all means go out and get nelson cruz on a one-year deal um obviously if cano is going to be a pivotal part of this organization next season and yes he's probably going to be dh then i don't see this happening but i'm going with the belief that robinson cano is not going to get in the way of potentially landing someone at the dh position yeah, I think Cruz, too, it's kind of funny, but if you look back at his entire career, he has horrible stats in Tropicana Field going back to his early days, even with the Rangers. And the Rays kind of thought, I guess, that was either insignificant or they could have helped him figure it out. It just didn't happen. But I still think he's going to be a monster next season wherever he signs. Yeah, some people just can't see the ball there. Willie Adamas became an, a, a debatable top 10 shortstop once he left Tampa. So like, yeah. it's 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 possible he just didn't see well. Uh, he's a beast. He's, he's the fine line of hitters. Yep. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad he brought up Adamas too, because it's easy to look at that trade and think, oh, okay, that it, he went to a Milwaukee and just had this change of heart and found all these different tools in his game. Well, no, there's a lot more factors that go into that. And Tropicana is by no means a hitter's park in a lot of ways. Even if you're adjusted there, it can still take a while. So yeah, I agree with you on that one for sure. But uh, now getting into pick number six, as we're right getting close to the halfway mark here. Uh, mark, what's your pick? 
Yeah, I went Kyle Schwarber. I know we talked about him already, so I won't harp on it too much. But um, I know with the way that this team is built right now, it doesn't make sense. But I'm of that. That's a problem for when we get this guy, that we figure it out, that we'll be able to move someone. We'll be able to make a move to make this team better. Because I really do think that Kyle Schwarber would be an automatic upgrade on whoever is going to be our DH right now. Um, whether it be Dom, JD, Cano, whoever it's going to be, Kyle Schwarber is better than all of them offensively. Um, and I think at the absolute worst, you're stuck with a couple guys that are DHs and Kyle Schwarber can just lock it down there for 30 home runs for however many games he plays. Uh, I think he'll be a positive. Love that. What about you, James? My next guy on the list is one Colin McHugh, sticking with pitchers here. McHugh is a guy who people thought was going to retire after he opted out of the 2020 season after a down year relative to his usual success 2019. But he came back last year with the Rays with an entirely new pitch mix where he was throwing 53% sliders and 33% cutters. So almost 90% of Colin McHugh's pitches were sliding, which is something that's very hard to hit. And that's only even after he developed the slider back in 2017. And that year, he threw it 14% of the time. Next year, 24% of the time. 2019, 44% of the time. Last year, 53% of the time. But he struck out over 30% of the batters he faced. He gave up almost no barrels on the whole season. Hitters were chasing against him. Hitters were whiffing against him. He didn't walk anybody. And this is why he only throws a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. And I think that Kyle McHugh is a guy who you could probably count on for something like 60 to 80 innings, pitching a couple couple you know three four inning starts or middle relief appearances while also being able to come in late in game and close the door but i think colin McHugh is a reliever who could really help the mets right now i'm 100 percent with you on that one yeah i'm i'm excited to get in McHugh shortly on my list too i think he's one of the most not just underrated relievers on the market i know you're probably wondering how does that make sense when you look at his numbers but when you think about colin McHugh, how many guys actually know in depth who that guy is outside of him being a former mets pick you probably wouldn't but he had a tremendous season, and I, I just love the versatility he brings as not just being utilized in a lot of different ways, but potentially as, you know, a lawn reliever or, you know, a spot star, however you want to go about things with him. But that's all I'll say on him for now because I'll be discussing him here shortly. But for my number six, I have a guy that I don't think is going to land with the Mets unless moves happen, that being really in trading Jeff McNeil, as I've discussed previously. And that is Trevor Story. I think Story makes a lot of sense for the Mets, really only if you trade McNeil. I know you guys might feel differently about that, but... With the Mets not really being willing to part with their first round pick to acquire a guy that has a comp pick tagged to him, I think that in itself is going to be a reason as to why this doesn't happen. And also, I look at if the Mets do say trade a Jeff McNeil or someone like that, that's where story makes sense on a, say, a mid-level deal, potentially high AAV. Is that enough to prime away from potentially a team like the Houston Astros if they lose Carlos Correa when well, he's a Texas native? I don't think so. But Story, there's no denying how much of an impact he'd have for the Mets. And keep in mind, the Mets tried to get Story. They had a lot of interest in him back at the trade deadline. Yes, I know it was with Zach Scott and Sandy Orson writing things. But until the Rockies said, no, we're not dealing him or John Gray, the Mets may very well have landed him over someone like Javi Baez in hindsight. And Story had a very solid season. Again, nothing crazy. Actually lows in a lot of ways, average-wise. But I do think he's a bounce-back candidate for sure. 24 bombs, 75 RBIs, 88 runs scored. At 251, 329, and 471 clip. He's only 28 years old. And again, if the Mets do part with someone like Jeff McNeil, they obviously are going to make sure that they have a replacement at second base. Could it be a long-term replacement? Possibly. And I would love to see Trevor Story in Queens if that scenario does, in fact, uh, come to fruition. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sweet. Okay, now game to the halfway mark uh, for our number five pick. Uh, mark, who you got? Number five. Here we go. We're going to start throwing out some big names now. I'm going to be spoiled rich kid here. We got lots of money. Let's spend it. Chris Bryant, number five. Ooh, interesting that you have him that low. But again, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit further. Uh, James, who's your number five pick? My number five pick is Kenley Jansen, sticking Ooh, with pitching. Cool. And that's kind of a rich kid move, too, because that's Jansen's going to cost him pretty petty. But he doesn't have a qualifying offer attached to him. He had a couple down years in a... 2018 2019 but he's really like pulled the nose up of his plane his color looks really good again he's thrown back up in like that 94 95 mile an hour range but he used to be very successful he has a slider that acts like a curveball that gets 40 percent whiffs he's he's a guy who you could put in the back end of your bullpen and i think he could be someone who really makes me you you mets fans much more comfortable with the way games end in queens not necessarily unseating edwin diaz a closer i think diaz is still better than jansen but he's someone who when DS pitches the day before, you'd be very comfortable when he closes the game. 
This is a really big debate when it comes to closer because there's still such a big divide in this fan base as to, you know, pro Diaz, anti Diaz. I know, Mark, you've been all over the place with Diaz, I feel like, especially. So have I. Um, I do think he is for certain still going to be the closer for the Mets. But if there's one thing that this offseason has told me is that the Mets do plan to eliminate as many what ifs as possible. They want to make sure that they have certainties for this roster. Um, so I don't think that Diaz is necessarily going to have the same leash as he has had in years past. So someone like Jansen would definitely help balance things if Diaz can potentially go in that eighth spot, especially. I mean, I'm not against it. I don't know how likely it is. I do think that's a hot take, but Jansen for sure would be a massive upgrade to this bullpen. And speaking of bullpen, uh, my number five pick is a guy you just discussed, Colin McHugh. I, I, he's one of my favorites, again, not to harp on much more, but look at his numbers this past year in 64 innings pitched. The 34-year-old had a one-and-a-half year array uh, during his time with the Tampa Bay Rays, his first year in Tampa. Um, just what a performance he had. His off-speed pitches are just disgusting. I want him back on the New York Mets. I know the Mets originally had him. They drafted him back over a decade ago. Let's bring him back to Queens on a multi-year deal won't cost the Mets too much, and they can get themselves a pretty dominant reliever that can be utilized in various different ways. You know, I mean, M McHugh looked really good, so I give me the right price. Actually, I don't even care about the right price. Pay him. Get him. <laughs> it's <laughs> not my money. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah, not um, my money. Awesome. awesome. All right, gain on to number four. Uh, Mark, who you have? Yeah, I, I told you I'm going spoiled rich kid here as I sit back in my chair getting all comfortable here. Clayton <laughs> Kershaw. I mean, let's go crazy, right? He's not going to come here. The, the likelihood of this is zero. I would say 0% chance. But you know what? I didn't think we were getting Max Scherzer either. And we did. I thought that That's one would fair. have been harder almost to get. So uh, Kershaw, get him. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's build one of the best rotations that we've seen in a while. One, two, three. Talk about the three generational pitchers of this last, you know, decade or so. You got Max Scherzer, Clayton Kershaw, Jacob DeGrom. Put them together. World Series. Let's do it. No, I like that. All right. What about you, James? My number four, another left-handed pitcher who's probably going to throw more innings than Clayton Kershaw this year. But someone you already mentioned, Yusei Kikuchi. I said I had some info on Yusei Kikuchi, and I do. He is someone who I think has a bad reputation right now because he came as a big money free agent from Japan in 2019, right? That was 2019. Mm -hmm. and yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. He was pretty disappointing. He was, I had like an awful year. His ERA was over five. And apparently he was just so disgusted by his performance that he was like doing anything he could to get better. He forked over a bunch of the money that the Mariners, of course, gave him. He went to driveline cleaned up all his mechanics and last year he sat between 94 and 96 miles an hour which was three miles an hour faster than he was as a rookie and he has a nice nice slider he has a good change up he's just the guy i think is much better than he's been given credit for and i think he is one of the few pitchers who's on the free agent market who is yet to have his best season yeah no i i like that pick for kikuchi i think that's high at least for me personally that's i don't even have him on my list but he's definitely someone that if the Mets would land has, you know, there is a certain level of risk similar to Steven Matz. Yes, the Mets actually tried to get Steven Matz at some point in this offseason, um, but definitely someone where if he can kind of get his control down a little bit, because he was awfully similar a lot to Taiwan Walker. If you look, they both had all-star first halves in 2021, and then unfortunately just fell off a cliff in the second half. But there's definitely still upside there. And the Mets have shown interest in Kikuchi. So I'm really curious to see if they're going to end up circling back on him or not one, whenever the lockout's lifted, right? But for my number four pick, staying on lefties as well. I like that we all had a lefty, but a different one. And mine's Carlos Rodon. Rodon is a guy similar to Kershaw in the sense that you don't know exactly how healthy he's going to be next season. He is a big wild card. Yes, he fluctuated with his velo a lot. And yes, there was some belief that he was holding low on his velo down the stretch of the season to make sure that he didn't really need to pump out the gas because he'd be ready for playoffs. But again, regardless of the reasons, the White Sox still did not offer him a qualifying offer. And what are the reasons for those? You know, we can come up with our own ideas for sure. But Rodon had his breakout year. The perfect time in his walk year, the 28-year-old, just insane numbers in just over 130 innings pitch, a 2.37 year array, a 2.68 times year array, you know, a 2.65 FIP. He was just a strikeout machine. He was in the 90 high 90 percentiles in every statistical category. The fastball was crazy. As long as it was consistent, he has a wipeout slider. He has, I think, all the tools to be a dominant, one of the most dominant southpaws in all baseball. If he stayed healthy, he probably would have made a really strong case for the Cy Young while well, Robbie Ray ended up winning it in the AL. So I love Carlos Rodon. I think that if he is healthy, he's 100% a gamble worth taking. Is that something the Mets are going to do? That's something I really don't know. I think
think that there's a solid chance they may try in the trade market still to land a pitcher. But if all else fails and they're going to just try to land players by spending, then Carlos Rodon, Scott Boris client, Mets just landed big Scott Boris client pitcher, Max Scherzer. Now let's do the same with Carlos Rodon. Yeah, that's my uh, that's my number three guy. I'll jump the gun here just because we're on the topic of Rodon. Um, I know he petered out last year towards the end, but that's kind of to be expected for a guy like Taiwan who didn't throw a lot of innings over the previous two seasons. Yep. But in that little sample that we did see, that 120, 130 innings, right, that he was really, really good, um, he, he simply was one of the best pitchers in baseball during that time. So for me, I like that the Mets can take a risk on him. I like giving him money. Again, we don't care about the money anymore. So if we have to eat our words on paying Carlos Rodon 20 to $25 million a year for a decent amount of time, I'm willing to take that risk because I really do think that when this guy is healthy, as we saw last year at times, having him in that rotation would be just a massive, massive step up for the Mets. Absolutely. Yeah, I think especially to have, not that you need a lefty in your rotation, but it, it's awfully satisfying to have not just any lefty in the middle of your rotation as your number three, but someone that can actually dominate, like where you have three options to start out your rotation, and then you can figure out what you do with your four and your five. But at that point, as long as everything's clicking on full cylinders, you can literally have J.D. Davis as your fifth starter and it wouldn't matter in my opinion. <laughs> but, uh, James, uh, gain on to you. What's your pick? Nice. I like you guys both had Rodon because he's on my list, but a little bit later on. But my number three, someone Mark already mentioned, Trevor Story. I think the only thing that's going to stop the Mets from signing Trevor Story is that stupid compensatory pick attached to him. I've been saying all offseason, he just reminds me so much of Marcus Semien coming off a down year where there's yeah, really no know. reason that he would have had a down year. And someone's going to get him on something relative to a discount, but maybe not because of that comp pick. So someone might actually be able to lock Trevor Story in for like five years, $110, $116 million. And you're getting a guy who can be a premier defender probably at three infield positions he has power he has speed he's a freak athlete like he's someone who i think is going to be just again one of the premier players in baseball sooner rather than later And i think that there's a lot of reasons the mets have that they would want to bring in someone who could play either second or third at a very high level story is that right now Absolutely. And even though that story doesn't necessarily have versatility that you'd like maybe from some other options, knowing that where he's at a rate and his age and really a Marcus Simeon comp, I think is just so perfect, especially if the Mets were to say go shorter term on him. There's literally no risk on their end and potentially you could hit the market again after having some dominant years in Queens, should have wished and really get paid big time. Like, let's be honest, the Mets can make that happen. Just throw him the bag, potentially make him the highest paid second baseman over a short to middle level deal. They can do it as long as that isn't going to be a problem for Steve Cohen. I, I think that comp pick is that biggest X factor along with Jeff McNeil. But to your point, yeah, there's no denying how talented Trevor Story is. I would love him in Queens too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for my pick, I'm definitely the only one that had a reliever in their top three. Yeah, I went with Andrew Chafin, and I know it's not just for his mustache. I promise you, this guy's an actual stud. I think that Chafin is someone that is not going to have not necessarily nearly as good of a year as he did in 2021 and 2022. I don't expect him to have a sub two year rate again. He had a 1.83 this past year with the Cubs and the A's. I wanted the Mets to trade for him heavily at the deadline when there was talks with the Cubs. I'm like, please have Chafin attached. It was Trevor Williams instead. That was fine. But no less, a 31-year-old had a really, really good year. And I think career rise for a 3.3 year rate reliever. I love the idea of Chafin coming in as your Aaron, Aaron Loop replacement. I don't think there's really anyone better available in the market right now, too. Yes, he'll be a little costly, but I think he'll be worthwhile for you. Multi-year deal, Mets get it done. That's your Aaron Loop replacement. And yeah, I just I think Chafin would be a massive get for the Mets in their pen on this win now stage over the next couple of years. Yeah, no, I think I think Chafin's good. My worry with him is that he had his Aaron Loop year where yeah. he's yep. pitched his best that he's ever going to. You're gonna, he's going to get the bag and just be fine. And like to me, I would rather take a risk and spend no money on a guy than give a guy who had his best season, like you said. Like Jim Adam Conley. Conley. Like it's Adam Conley or Deekman. About relievers, like you kind of want to be able to only give a reliever a one-year deal because you just don't know what the reliever is going to look like from year to year. There's so many relievers who pop up and are great, who then are great, then go down and be bad. I will never forget about Antonio Bastardo, who had like a year and a half good. <laughs> Phillies, the Mets gave him a three-year deal oh, for nine million per, oh, and he was God. literally never even useful for them. Caught him relievers, in that same year. You want to just keep that risk as low as possible. Relievers, less about money, is more about years you're committing to them. But Chafin, I think like he probably will be fine. I just think that he's going to, you, you could buy probably three relievers who might be as good for that, that price. 
And that's a, and that's a completely fair argument. I know that mine's more of a bolder take, but I think it's just a gamble knowing that the Mets need to make sure that they at least get one lefty in there. I really like Deekman as well. Connolly's a very interesting pick for the bullpen too on kind of buying low and you know hoping for the best. But either way, if if Chafin's available, which he is right now, I don't see how the Mets don't at least try their absolute best to make something happen on the shorter term. I think it's funny how all three of us had a lefty pitcher for a reliever, all different, by the way, which yeah. is like kind of even more so of a signal of like, there's so much out there. There's no reason. And this to wasn't like planned for everyone watching this. None of this was actually planned. So I think yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, okay. So I, what are we number two now? Number two. two. Okay. All right, Mark, take it away. Number two, Trevor story. There it is. Um, yeah, I just, I think if we're talking about next year we're trying to make a push you got scherzer you got all these guys canna escobar even on a two-year deal right that seems to be the window of positives but no one talks about the negatives of when you leave it and how screwed up your body gets and then two he also had no protection around him so there was literally no incentive for anybody to ever throw him a good pitch not that that's in a reason why his numbers did drop so massively but you've seen when guys go from a lineup that did have protection, he had Nolan Arenado around him. Even Charlie Blackman was able to be a competent hitter in the past, not last year. He had nobody. CJ Crone, that was it. And really, like, he still pitched to CJ Crone over Trevor Story every time. Just even last year before the season started, you're talking to Trevor Story as a possible top three shortstop in all of baseball. And the fact that he's just kind of going, you know, untouched, kind of going unappreciated, I'd love to be the team that appreciates Trevor Story. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up how he is in the lineup currently, you know, first year without Arenado, right? That does make a big difference. Maybe it's not crazy, but still being that go-to guy, just imagine what story would be in a deep Mets lineup the way it is right now offensively. Yeah, I, I'm i really glad you brought that up. That's a great point that I wasn't initially thinking of. Uh, his games. Go ahead. Especially just like last point about story. He is, if you had to take one thing away from him, he's a bit of a free swinger. So when you are a free swinger and you are going to see less strikes, and you are going to see less fastballs, that's probably going to affect you relatively more. And that and is especially in a contract year when you're trying to get paid and yeah. you know you have to put up numbers so that you can get paid. Squeezing the bat too tight. White knuckler. Yep. 100%. Yeah. All right. Number two. Number two for me. Yeah. Mr. Carlos Correa for all the same reasons, but he's someone who I think that would very well suit him for the next 10 years as good of a defender, a shortstop as he was last year. We know that Correa is a bit of a bigger guy for the position and those legs are getting heavy and he's dealt with a lot of soft tissue injuries and a lot of freak injuries and he has a cannon for an arm. So I think you can give Carlos Correa 10 years, $330 million, similar to what the Padres gave Manny Machado. You stick him at third base and you say, you're not leaving until you turn 40 years old. And I think that would be great because he is truly one of the, premier hitters in baseball he uh, has one of the highest max exit velocities last year he walks significantly more than he did actually no he doesn't walk significantly more when he came to the league he still walks 12 percent, which is a significant number he doesn't stri he strikes out far less than league average he's someone who i think can just and he has he hits the ball hard enough and far enough to where i hope and pray that city field would not be a major deterrent to his power production carl's cray is somebody i would give basically a blank check to play third base forever I love that pick for Cray. I'll be touching on him shortly, hint, hint. But for my number two, I, I'm going with Chris Bryant. And it was actually pretty hard for me not to have him number one. But there's obvious reasons as to why. And I know, KB, there's a lot of doubters with him based on, you know, his defensive ability. I get it. The guy's in a gold glove. But he literally played five positions last year. I don't want to hear that. That, okay, yes, I know he's not going to be stud defensively. But his versatility is exactly why I think he makes so much sense for the Mets and exactly why I do think that he's probably the most realistic position player that I have on my entire list for you today to land with the Mets, even on a mid to longer level uh, term type deal. Yes, I don't know if the Mets are going to be willing to go past five years. They didn't do it with Javi Baez. Why would they do it with KB? Well, KB, again, gives you that versatility. If they're so concerned about Brett Beatty, who's the number one third base prospect in all of baseball right now, if they want to make sure that he comes up and just fine, then you put KB in the corner outfields. You get creative with it. And when you look at his numbers this past year, had a great first half. Second half was a little up and down. Didn't do great regular season with the Giants, but was their best playoff performance. So that's at least something. The 29-year-old in 144 games played, had 25 bombs, 86 runs scored, 73 RBIs, 10 stolen bags, and a uh, 265, 353, 481 clip. Yes, I know he's, again, not someone that you want to necessarily commit long-term to, but if you can go a five-year deal at most, I'm all for it for the Mets. And that versatility just keep. Billy Epler wants versatile guys. He said it already. I would love guys that play both in the infield and outfield. There's no one that checks off the boxes better on that front than Chris Bryant, who brings you automatically accountability as a veteran in that locker room and also playoff performer who knows what it takes to win. 
There's just so many reasons as to why I think KB makes sense. And if he wasn't versatile, I don't even think we're having this discussion right now. But because he is, that's why I think he's such a favorite. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. He's he's super boring. Like, you look at his numbers, and he's just, he's just been very good pretty much his entire career outside of 2020. But he's just a boring guy, which, like, you never would have thought that with how he came up. And I think that's probably why he came up with such a high and then has never really lived up to that rookie of the year MVP years that he did in back-to-back -back seasons. But he's still pretty strong. And, yeah, at number two, I mean, I think I, ha I had him at five. Um, and it, it really just comes down to personal preference. Like, he's, he's good. He would help this team massively, 100%. Yep. I do see the value in Bryant, but like I'm a little lower in him than you guys. I actually didn't even have him on my list just because I do see a guy who's boring and good, but he's someone who has trended at least relatively downward for the greater part of his career as a guy who's also dealt with a few semi-serious injuries. And not that I don't think he's still a very good player and very useful because I think he's both of those things, but he just is someone who if they were to give a fifth or a sixth year to, I could see some really like some really serious downside to the last couple of years of a deal like that. But I still he would still make this team very clearly better. But I think I I think about these lists kind of more in like in terms of value curve. And I see him as being one of the more riskier investments that's still out there. I definitely see the risk with him if you're going longer term. And that's why I think that it would be most ideal if the Mets are somehow maybe take advantage of however long the lockout goes down. And they, again, do a Simeon type, not on a one-year deal, but just shorter term, throw the bag at him, give him maybe an option after a couple of years or something like that, or a mutual option, whatever it would be to get it done. Again, the Mets are in a beautiful spot where they can just throw so much, especially on the shorter term, as long as they're willing, um, where really, as long as you're a player that has interest in coming here, it makes so much sense for both sides. So that just adds to the further reasoning as to why I personally think he makes sense. But uh, gain on to number one, uh, I think we all know what Mark's going to be, but go ahead. Carlos Correa. I mean, everyone's talked about him at this point now, but um, if you're talking about the best free agent on the market, it's Carlos Correa. If you're talking about one of the best players in baseball that are still available, it's Carlos Correa. I mean, he's a, he's a top 20 player in the league. Um, it's weird to say that we'd move him to third, even though I completely agree, because he probably is a better shortstop right now in the moment than Francisco Lindor. But Lindor, Lindor is going to be the guy at short. And I think if you move him to third, you don't get as much value as you do out of him at short. Where a guy like Correa, who has a cannon of an arm, has the injury issues, 100%, is a bigger guy. Third base kind of fits him better, I think, than it does shortstop long-term, like you said earlier, James. And just the fact that when he is healthy, again, that is kind of the big risk here with Carlos Correa is when he is healthy, he's only put up like one or two healthy seasons in his career. He is one of the best players in baseball. He makes a huge impact. And in the postseason, I mean, the guy is just on a different level. He hits every big home run ever. It seems like anytime you see something big happening with the Astros, Carlos Correa is involved. I like that he's got a little chip on his shoulder too. He really embraced the villain, the evil side thing with the cheating scandal. And he's got Scott Boris. We got Max Scherzer. There's a good relationship here. It's beneficial for Scott Boris to be friends with the New York Mets and Steve Cohen. Bring Carlos along too. I would love him. A Rod moved to third for Jeter. Correa can move to third for Lindor. <laughs> I love that. All right, that James, funny. who you got? Funny way to close it out, Mark. But uh, I'm my number one guy is Carlos Rodon, and this goes against all the things I just said about Chris Bryant because Rodon <laughs> is a guy who's going to take either four, five, or six years, and there's a there's not even a non-zero chance. It's probably like a forty percent chance that he just becomes a zero for a couple of those years, but. When I look at this Mets team right now, their biggest need is starting pitching. It's gaping, it's glaring, it's monumental. And when you want to buy a free agent, you want to buy upside because so few upside guys actually make it to the open market. Rodon's one of the few guys who is a free agent pitcher who actually has upside of being a frontline starting pitcher. And I, he has awful injury history. He's had Tommy John surgery. He's had arthroscopic shoulder surgery. He's been on the IL for bursitis, elbow inflammation, shoulder fatigue. Like you can run right down the list for Rodon. And last year, his arm did completely die in August. He only got about 80 innings under his belt before he literally stopped being able to throw fastballs that were hard. That was a big thing to help him in the first half. The fact that he was throwing the ball consistently like 97, 98, 99 miles an hour. Only 2% of his fastballs from August to the end of the year were 98 miles an hour or above against 13% in the first half of the year. But again, in the first half of the year, when the arm was okay, he had the fourth highest K rate in baseball. He had the fourth highest K minus walk in baseball. He had the 10th lowest whip. He had the seventh highest F war. Like his potential is so great that I think it is probably worth the potential disaster that it could be if this thing goes wrong. Especially given the state, as you alluded to already, what the Mets rotation is in right now. Yes. Should they try to go for more certainties? I absolutely think so. And do I think that there's better options potentially in the trade market, like to get a certain guy? Yes. But yet yeah, you're going to have to give up a haul in order to do so. So given where the Mets are at right now and given how they've been building this team through free agency, that's been abundantly obvious by now. I think Rodon is for certain that guy you take that gamble on. He's high risk. 
but he's most definitely high reward. And he's someone that at least where you know that, yes, he came off of a career year, but he's still in his prime. He's 28. It's not like that this is a situation where he's having these issues. And he's already in his late 30s and is in the twilight of his career. There's a lot of reasons as to why this is something you can bet on and really have something that's going to be a great outcome in the end. Um, but for my pick, like Mark and like uh, James for your number two, it's Carlos Correa. And Correa is someone that I don't see happening. Not that I don't want to happen, but of course, this is a pipe dream pick we're talking but I will say, is him going to Scott Boris going to change anything that could benefit the Mets? Maybe, because if there's one thing that's so interesting about Carlos Correa and free agency is this lockout is such a big factor into things because how much time are players going to realistically have to sign whenever uh, they have until the season's starting, assuming that the season starts at time, which who knows at this rate, right? But when you look at the teams available, that makes sense for Carlos Correa. For a while, it really did feel like the Detroit Tigers, and they're no longer there. They went for Baez, and I, I don't see them moving Baez a second bring Correa. So I'm sorry, Tigers fans, if you want that. You just don't see it happening. But you look at the Yankees. I don't see the Yankees gain Correa. Uh, I, it seemed like a fit for a while. I'll be a little surprised if that happens. They have some really gr they have great short stops uh, depth wise. And yes, I know that you can shift Correa, and that's what the Mets would do. But the Mets are going to go all in. They can throw a long term contract at Correa. Still, you could have him at third, and then if Correa is willing, you could potentially shift him to second when a guy like Brett Beatty is ready. Because Beatty, if he profiles well and you don't want to trade him. Mets can get creative, and if you put Correa to second, that gives you an even stronger ability to have him healthy longer term, which is what you want most for a guy you're going to sign to a decade for $330 plus million, right? So I think that there are justifiable reasons as to why you go for Correa outside of his town alone, his age of 27, 28. He makes perfect sense. Do I think it's likely? Hell no. But if the Mets are going all in right now, they have more money than anyone else. What a shock that would be to the baseball world. If you thought the Mets were already shocking people with landing Scherzer, Marte, and everyone else, just imagine what things would be like if they capped off their offseason with a Carlos Correa on their roster. That would be something special, truly. Give him 10 for 350, 12 for 400. I don't care what it costs. Go get Carlos Correa. <laughs> yeah, I just think he's going to be able to hit literally forever. Like the rest does not matter. No, uh, he's one of the few guys that have been able to hit the free agent market recently. I mean, we're getting, like you mentioned, James Machado or Harper, or the, those big names that you just should not care about the price. You should be like, oh, if, if I want the best players, Carlos Correa is that guy. If only Steve Cohen could have bought this team one year early and been able oh to God. sign Manny Machado. Oh, my God. Oh God. God. Well, and like, Wheeler. Don't get yeah. me started. <laughs> oh, don't, don't bring that up. <laughs> bring up Zach Wheeler, please. <laughs> Zach Wheeler said. <laughs> we're trying we're trying to have fun here okay but with that being said i love these picks there are a lot of names that i have talked about you know in separate videos and streams on my channel that makes sense i really feel bad that i have tommy fam off this list again honorable mention i really like that pick as a depth move for the mets a lot of them make sense but guys it was a pleasure thank you guys so much for coming on sharing your list to all their viewers mets fans and mets fans of course make sure to let us know in the comments below what would your top 10 list be and which one do you agree with the most or disagree with the most i'm sure that some of our picks may came off a little outrageous but again until proven otherwise in this lockout we got to live a little and kind of shoot for the stars so i like a lot of these moves i do hope that at least some of them come into fruition but guys any final words before we wrap things up here let's hope go lockout out ends yeah let's get let's get baseball back please so we don't have to keep talking about these top 10 free agents that we hope can happen we can finally see what's going to happen i'm tired of it <laughs> Yeah, me too. Yeah, trust me. I couldn't have said it better. But again, guys, everyone, please make sure to check out the Mets Up podcast. But of course, Draft Neck Mark, James Shiano, links in the description as always. Make sure to check it out. They have weekly pods coming out, doing great content on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, doing great things. It won't be the last time you see them here on the channel, of course. But again, thank you guys so much. I'll talk to you soon. And guys, let's go Mets. Let's go Mets.